Servicing the amateur radio community all around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio. For the past 23 years, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1198, the World Radio Day edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. New rules for Field Day 2022 have been released. We will tell you all about the new changes. The ARRL announces a brand new worldwide digital contest. The Dayton Hamvention looks like it's going to be a go for 2022. Heil Sound changes hands. We will tell you all about the new owners. The ARRL National Convention is happening this weekend. We will have all the details taking you to Orlando, Florida. Special event operations will mark the 80th anniversary of the Voice of America. A geomagnetic storm has taken recently deployed Starlink satellites out of orbit. And a pair of college sophomores at John Carroll University radio station WJCU-FM recently set a new Guinness World Record. We will tell you all about their achievement in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will tell us about methods to improve your home network's Wi-Fi signal. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will tell us how to test your radio's audio frequency response. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a look at the post-World War II amateur and takes a close-up look at the state of amateur radio in the late 1940s. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will tell us about the best way to replace the rotor on your tower. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, where we recently had a taste of spring, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York, where the 50-degree weather has us drilling holes in maple trees and also marks the beginning of mud season, I'm Don Hewlett, K2AETJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York news bureau, where the weather is still predictably unpredictable. I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where it's warm one day and cold the next, just typical winter weather. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off our news this week. After taking a few detours over the past couple of years due to the COVID-19 pandemic, ARRL Field Day rules are being updated on a permanent basis starting this summer. With all the details and rule changes for Field Day 2022, we go to Ellsworth, Maine, where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. ARRL conducted a Field Day community survey with invitations propagated far and wide and direct emails sent to more than 15,000 individuals and ARRL-affiliated clubs. After sorting through, reviewing, and discussing the survey results, the ARRL Programs and Services Committee recommended a number of rule changes for ARRL Field Day, which will take place this year over the June 25th, 26th weekend. Starting this year, the maximum PEP output for a transmitter used by anyone, at least if you're turning in a log, will be 100 watts. The power multiplier of 2 will remain in place, and the high power category will be removed from the rules. Until this year, the maximum low power limit had been 150 watts. The power multiplier will remain at 5 for QRP participants running a maximum 
of 5 watts or less. A couple of changes instituted initially as accommodations for the COVID-19 pandemic will remain in place. Class D home stations will continue to be able to earn points for contact with other Class D stations. The club aggregate scoring change initiated in 2020 as a temporary measure will become part of the permanent rules in the aggregate scoring plan. The scores of individual stations are combined under the score of a single club. Another change involving Rule 7.3.2, Media Publicity, Rules to date have offered 100 bonus points for attempting to obtain publicity and demonstrating same. With the ease of posting via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and various other media websites, now you gotta get it. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. As previously announced, 100 watts is now the low power category limit for all ARRL and International Amateur Radio Union HF contests, effective January 1st, 2022. And this reminder, as Rick said in his report, field day participants will now be required to obtain publicity, not just try to do so. Any combination of bona fide media hits would qualify for the bonus points. For example, posting the details of your upcoming or ongoing field day activity or your field day results on a club or news media site, on Facebook or via Twitter and Instagram would meet the bonus criteria. Photos and videos are encouraged as part of media posts. The ARRL Worldwide Digital Contest will debut at 1800 UTC on June 4th, ending at 2359 on June 6th, 2022. All non-RTTY modes are permitted. Going forward, RTTY will be the sole mode for the ARRL RTTY Roundup, which will continue to take place in January. With more details on the new contest, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from Ellsworth, Maine. In broad strokes, this will be an HF to 6-meter event. Entry categories are single operator, one radio, single operator, two radio, and multi-single. Overlays in the single operator categories will include all enclosed antennas and maximum of eight operating hours. Operating assistance is permitted for all operating categories. The exchange for the ARRL Worldwide Digital Contest will be the station's four-character grid square designation. Stations may work each other once per band, regardless of digital mode. Participants will earn a point for each contact, plus one point for each 500 kilometers, 310 miles, between stations. So a contact between stations a thousand kilometers apart would be worth three points. Your total score is total contact points. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Power categories will be QRP, 5 watt transmitter output or less, and low power, maximum 100 watts PEP transmitter output. ARRL makes available a grid center distance calculation tool. Options include kilometers, always rounded up, distance between pairs, and points. For instructions on how to submit logs, visit the ARRL contest page. Logs will be due seven days after the event has concluded. In succeeding years, the worldwide digital contest will take place on the first full weekend of June. Full details on the new operating event are on the ARRL website. The upcoming Dayton Hamvention 2002 looks to be a go. With more details on what we can look forward to, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from Ellsworth, Maine. Hams and vendors hoping to attend Dayton Hamvention 2022 have been asking what, if any, COVID-19 regulations would be in place. Hamvention management says it's monitoring the situation closely. Hamvention General Chairman Rick Allnut WS8G issued a statement, We cannot guarantee what government may decide about unknown changes in the pandemic, he said. It's become obvious that the state of Ohio is very unlikely to call a halt to large gatherings anytime soon. Despite a recent spike in Omicron variant COVID cases and hospitalizations, there is no move to restrict large indoor or outdoor events, such as sports events, Allnut said.
Allnut added that he anticipates that the official state guidance may be to recommend, not require, face masks and social distancing, but does not expect to be checking attendees' vaccination status on site. Hamvention will support state guidance. Updates on Hamvention and COVID-19 regulations related to the event will be posted on the Hamvention website, www.hamvention.org. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Hamvention, an ARRL-sanctioned event, will be held May 20th through the 22nd at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. Heil Sound has changed hands. Founded by Bob Heil, K9EID, and based in Fairview Heights, Illinois, Heil Sound is a manufacturer of microphones, microphone accessories, and audio accessories for both professionals and amateurs. The new owners are Heil Sound President and Chief Executive Officer Ash Levitt and Director of Operations Steve Warford. Sarah Heil, who was co-founder of Heil Sound, has retired, but Bob Heil will continue to do outreach work and amateur radio product design as founder and CEO Emeritus. My life has been about achieving great sound, whether on the concert stage or in the amateur radio world, Bob Heil recounted. I've watched Heil Sound go from a regional sound company to a world-class microphone manufacturer. This company has been my passion, but it is time for me to step aside. There is no better team to carry the company forward than Ash and Steve, and I have the utmost confidence in them. Heil Sound is a name well known within the worldwide amateur radio community for its microphones and boomset microphone headset combinations. The company marked its 50th anniversary in 2016. The company began in 1966 as Ye Old Music Shop, a music store in Marissa, Illinois, Heil's hometown. Heil initially made a name for himself working with music performers to provide sound reinforcement for their live gigs, initially supplying full sound system packages for venues and festivals throughout the Midwest and later working with world-class acts such as Humble Pie, The Who, The Grateful Dead, and Joe Walsh, WB6ACU. Heil said it was the Dead's Jerry Garcia who suggested the Heil sound name. Among other innovations, Heil created the quadraphonic sound system for the Who's Quadrophenia tour, as well as the Heil talk box, made famous by Joe Walsh and Peter Frampton. Levitt and Warford both started working with Heil Sound as teenagers, building and packaging products. Levitt took a different career path in academia for several years, but continued to regularly consult with Heil Sound. He returned to Heil Sound full-time in 2017 and assumed the role of president in 2020. Warford worked his way up in the company over the course of his tenure and, for the past several years, has been responsible for daily operations. Steve and I are honored to carry forward the legacy of Heil Sound, Levitt said. We care very deeply about Heil Sound's role in the industry and intend to build on that going forward with new products and greater distribution. An important part of that role that we pride ourselves on is the connection we have with professionals and end users. As a musician and former broadcaster, I have spent a lot of time on stages and in studios in front of a microphone and understand our users' needs. I and everyone at Heil Sound share a passion for what we do because it helps others achieve their creative endeavors. Heil Sound has been in business since 1966. And by the way, this story was recorded using a Heil PR40 microphone. Thanks, Bob. The ARRL National Convention kicked off this past Thursday morning with more than 1,000 hams gathered at the Double Tree by Hilton Hotel Orlando at SeaWorld. There, they attended any of four simultaneous training tracks running morning and afternoon, bisected by the midday convention luncheon. The four training tracks were Contest University, Emergency Communications Academy, Hands-On Handbook, and Technology Academy. In Contest University, which was run by track leaders Tim Duffy, K3LR, and Terry Greiser, K8MNJ, along with ARRL staff liaison Bart Yonke, W9JJ, attendees garnered tips and knowledge on how to improve and optimize their contesting techniques and skills, not only for fun and points, but as rehearsal for emergency communications when the assistance of ham radio operators is direly needed. 
There was a full house in the Emergency Communications Academy, which covered current protocols, techniques, and responsibilities for volunteer radio amateurs as they serve partner public safety entities. Thanks for this workshop. Go to track leader Rick Palm, K1CE, lead instructor Gordon Gibby, KX4Z, ARRL staff liaison Mike Walters, W8ZY, and a panel of nationally recognized subject matter experts and trainers. The Hands-On Handbook track took attendees through a variety of presentations on ham radio operational practices, such as dealing with radio frequency interference, writing ham-related programming code, remote operating, and more. The track leader was Josh Nass, KI6NAZ, familiar to many hams as the creator of the popular YouTube channel Ham Radio Crash Course and the 2020 winner of the ARRL Bill Leonard Award. And the ARRL staff liaison was Steve Goodgame, K5ATA. The Technology Academy was led by Kristen McIntyre, K6WX, ARRL Director, Pacific Division, with ARRL staff liaison Ed Hare, W1RFI. The track took attendees through subjects that included RF exposure rule compliance, SWR, and digital communications. The luncheon keynote speaker was ARRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA, who addressed passion for ham radio and encouraged all to get radioactive. The original 75-watt kilowatt transmitter that went on the air for the first Voice of America broadcast 80 years ago this month is the centerpiece of a special event station celebrating that historic anniversary. The transmitter no longer works and is part of an exhibit at the Voice of America Museum in Westchester, Ohio. But there are plenty of working transmitters and transceivers to celebrate the day it went live on February 1, 1942. Hams will be calling QRZ as W3V, W8O, and W4A on February 19th and 20th from Voice of America sites in Washington, D.C., Westchester, Ohio, and Greenville, North Carolina. Jocelyn Brault, KD8VRX of the Westchester Amateur Radio Association, WC8VOA, said certificates will be available for anyone who works any or all of the three stations. There will also be digital QSL cards for each individual site, as well as paper QSLs. Be listening on CW, SSB, and FT8 both days between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern Time. For details, visit any of the three stations' pages on QRZ.com. After years of exploring options, NASA has finally decided on how it wants to retire the International Space Station. As detailed in a new statement, the space agency is hoping to keep the aging outpost alive until the end of 2030. After that, it'll make the massive structure plunge towards a remote region of the Pacific Ocean known as Point Nemo. NASA is selling the retirement as a transition of operations to commercial services, reiterating its emphasis on supporting private public endeavors in Earth's orbit. In an official ISS transition plan sent to Congress, NASA detailed its plans to finally deorbit the ISS. First, mission control will power thrusters to slowly lower the station's altitude. Once close to the Earth's atmosphere, around January 2031, it will perform its final maneuver to ensure it lands in the South Pacific Ocean uninhabited area. That Point Nemo area is a popular place for nations to sink their space debris, with countries having dropped more than 263 pieces there since 1971. Not all visiting vehicles can be used to assist in the deorbit, reads the plan. NASA and its partners have evaluated varying quantities of Russian Progress spacecraft and determined that three can accomplish the deorbit. NASA may also make use of Northrop Grumman's Cygnus spacecraft to help. The International Space Station is entering its third and most productive decade as a groundbreaking scientific platform in microgravity, said Robin Gatins, director of the International Space Station at NASA, in the statement. We look forward to maximizing these returns from the space station through 2030 while planning for transition to commercial space destinations that will follow. While the ISS may soon be retired, NASA is already looking beyond it to the future. The agency is working with commercial partners to attach docking modules to the station and is also hoping to establish at least one of three commercial space stations with the help of private industry. NASA is also still planning on sending astronauts to the moon well before the station's retirement. Listed under a deep space exploration goal through 2030 in the transition plan, the agency is hoping to use the ISS as an analog for a Mars transit mission.
it'll be the sad end to one of the biggest international scientific cooperatives ever undertaken and may well mark the decline of the multination approach to space research and exploration. Both China and Russia, for instance, are hoping to establish their own space stations within the coming years. China, for one, has already sent astronauts to inhabit the first modules in orbit and is planning for its station to be fully operational by the end of the year. For now, scientists will continue their invaluable hard work on board the aging orbital outpost while occasionally filling in the literal cracks that are starting to form in the station's walls. What's become a regular March event, the next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo will be held live from March 12th and 13th and then on demand for 30 days afterward. With more details on this popular virtual ham fest, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from Ellsworth, Maine. More than 60 speakers will deliver presentations on their subject areas. There's content for everyone, whether a newly licensed ham looking for the next steps to use that license, or a 30-plus year experienced ham looking for new projects, the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo organizers promise. Virtual visitors may watch as many presentations as they want and return anytime within 30 days to view speakers and presentations they may have missed as well as explore exhibitor offerings. The Virtual Ham Expo will debut new technology that organizers say will further improve the live video interaction experience with exhibitors and fellow operators. Early bird tickets go on sale on February 1st. Tickets are $10 through March 6th. Visit www.qsotodayhamexpo, that's all one word, dot com. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. An example of a few of the upcoming presentations will include Core HF Communication Concepts, Fundamentals of Shortwave Propagation, Deep Dive of an FPGA DVB-S2 Implementation, Fun with a Nano VNA, and Helically Wound Vertical for 160 Meters. The complete list of presentations is available from the Virtual Ham Expo homepage. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, is a QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo partner. In South Africa, Francois Botha, Zulu Sierra 4 X-Ray, said that to his mind, one of the finest hobbies one can cultivate and get involved with is amateur radio. Francois was licensed in 1979, and his involvement grew from just an interest to a passion spanning 43 years, until up to the end of 2021, when he sold off all his HF, VHF and UHF equipment due to retirement village restrictions on antennas. However, now he is embarking on a totally new adventure, the abundance of communication software available on the internet. Francois said that after feeling that his coax had been cut, why in fact should anybody kiss the hobby goodbye? This is a problem faced by many who reach retirement age and find themselves cut off from the outside world. On the contrary, there is an abundance of networks available through which Francois is building up a totally new circle of friends. Another problem facing amateur radio is the lack of control of domestic equipment being sold, which doesn't comply with interference restrictions on the amateur bands. The level of electronic interference on most bands is now almost untenable. Francois said that amateur radio enthusiasm is on the wane, probably due to the cost of new equipment that's gone through the ceiling. In many countries, the financial rate of exchange has made the purchase of equipment no more than a dream. But more encouragingly in some countries, even governments are getting involved in amateur radio, not as operators, but in an effort to revitalise interest in the hobby. Could it be that a lack of new technical and innovative developments worries them, inventions which so often in the past came from the shack of radio experimenters? It's true that, historically, the vast majority of innovative and technical advancements in communications worldwide came from the bench of an enthusiast, just trying out something new. This will never stop, but we need to generate a new interest in ham radio. Francois said that the internet offers an open window to good communications worldwide in a very supportive way. There are many avenues open to all licensed amateurs to communicate and share information. 
HF, VHF and UHF will never die. Once propagation improves on HF, all the supportive communication done via the internet, new ideas, sharing and solving of problems will allow all of us to continue where we left off. Popular alternative means of communication include Echolink, especially the new CQ Advantage. There's also Dude Star, a window to digital voice DMR and DSTAR communication. And there's AllStarLink.org, which is opening up communications to many repeaters and networks worldwide. And then there's The Peanut developed specifically for amateur radio, with various rooms in which one can communicate in different languages and specific countries. These are but a few of the internet links. The radio procedures are strictly according to the book, and no non-hams may operate in these areas. Discussions are often extremely technical, and with good communication, many a problem gets solved. Francois concluded by commenting that the amateur radio hobby will always continue and hopefully expand in time. Sharing information, even via video conferencing, has in many cases resulted in a serious issue not just being solved, but even improved upon. So, let's make use of what is available, not just via the magnificent ease of today's communication, but in an effort to expand ham radio and create new interest. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Let's talk tech, you and me. We're having a fun time. This is like a little user group here. We help each other. It hasn't changed much. Technology is still hard to use. Companies still don't really give you much help. And so that's what we're doing. We get together and we help, our, help each other. Maybe you could cover the basics of Wi-Fi and what I can do to improve coverage. This is a universal question, uh, partly because, and you nailed it, we ask more of Wi-Fi now than we ever have before. The IoT devices, multiple phones, multiple computers, you might have a dozen or more devices sharing that Wi-Fi access. Uh, I checked myself on my home uh, Wi-Fi network, and I have two networks, one at Euro and one Orbi. I have more than 50 devices. Of course, I'm an outlier, but still... People have a lot of Wi-Fi devices now. Then, of course, your neighbor has lots of them too, right? In fact, if you you know, look at your Wi-Fi menu, you may be seeing a dozen different access points. Some neighbors are, uh, are choosing Wi-Fi routers that say, we're super powerful, double, quadruple, MIMO, and they're interfering more with you than they used to. It all adds up to terrible Wi-Fi. Uh, and and it, it does underscore one particular problem that all Wi-Fi has. It's Wi-Fi is polite. If your access point, here's another access point, ha -ha, or another device ha -ha, on the network, it'll shut up. It'll clam up. It'll wait a random amount of time, then start again. And if it hears your neighbor's Wi-Fi ha -ha, on the same channel in the same frequency, it'll shut up again. That's why Wi-Fi is so inconsistent. You might even notice pausing. It's it's terrible for uh, streaming video and, and voice calls. Most streaming video is buffering, so it's not as noticeable. But I have to say, when we do our shows with Skype, we tell all of our contributors, and whatever you do, you can't be on Wi-Fi. You have to get a wired network, and that's, it, that's for that reason. Uh, when it comes to improving your signal, I'm gonna refer you to a great article from Ars Technica, Jim Salter, who is really a guru of networking, wrote it. It's called The Ars Technica Semi-Scientific Guide to Wi-Fi Access Points. And he recommends him a number of things. I'm not going to go through everything in the article. I would strongly recommend you read it because it's got some great tips for improving Wi-Fi. Tip number one, get a signal meter on your laptop or on your phone. If you have an iPhone, unfortunately, the way Apple works, they don't let third-party apps uh, access the signal strength coming in from the Wi-Fi radio. So iPhones are no good for this. But there are uh, soft, there's programs you could run like NetSpot on your Android device. If you have a laptop, Insider with two S's is really good from metageek.com. So once you get these on a portable device of some kind, laptop is fine, you're going to want to make a map of your Wi-Fi signals. Uh, in fact, there's a there's a Wi-Fi mapping app that I use on Android all the time. Let me let me just quickly check my Android phone because off the top of my head, I it's really handy for getting a sense, making an actual like colored map of all the all the Wi-Fi. It's called Wi-Fi Heat Map, 
And so if you have an Android phone, this is a great tool. You walk around your whole house. You'll then have a map with different colors of Wi-Fi. Signal strength, don't get obsessed about signal strength. Anything better than 67, minus 67 dB is, is, is fine. In fact, you can actually have a, if it's too strong, if that negative number is too low, like minus 10, it can actually overpower your system and make Wi-Fi worse. So minus 67 is normal. It, because that's a negative number, remember, anything lower, minus 66, 65, that's better. Anything higher, 68, 69 is worse. 67 is, Jim says, the cutoff point. You can also, in one of these Wi-Fi tools like Insider, see which bands are most congested. There are 11 bands in the U.S. on any given frequency. Really, there's only three because you have the middle band and the surrounding bands. Uh, that each channel uses up. And there's, of course, th three different frequencies. There's a 2.4 gigahertz frequency and there's two 5 gigahertz frequencies that Wi-Fi access points can use. It's great once you get a map of everything, you'll have a much better understanding of where the trouble spots are in your house, but also of which frequencies and channels your devices are using. Most of your devices can be allowed to pick the channel. It's It's really, I think, an exercise in a futility to try to assign channels. The devices will do, uh, I, and the router will do as, as good a job as you would, maybe better. And they may be moving those around from time to time. The thing to keep in mind is Wi-Fi, and this is a great analogy. I think Jim might have come up with this. Somebody did. Wi-Fi is like a lamp in a room. Uh, you, you get a pool of light from a lamp in a room, but as you go outside the room, that pool of light is weaker. Go through two doors, it's not going to make any difference at all. Wi-Fi is similar to that. A single wall will slow Wi-Fi down. By the time you've got two walls between you and the access point, you've got very little signal coming through. The farther away you get, the slower the service will be to the point where you just don't get any Wi-Fi at all. There's also other obstacles. And the worst obstacle in Wi-Fi is humans. Those big bags of water that are walking around. If Wi-Fi has to go through a human, it's going to attenuate the signal something awful. And you can verify that with your signal meter standing in front of your Wi-Fi access point. Turn your back to it and move the signal meter back and forth. You'll see you really attenuate the signal. That's one reason you want to put your routers, your access points, and your extenders high up. Have them aiming down over the heads of humans, not firing through humans. That seems weird, but in fact, that does make a difference. Higher up is better for an access point. Signal extenders, those are the old school way of expanding Wi-Fi. You'd have an access point, and then you'd buy, you know, Linksys access point from Linksys, some signal extenders. The problem with them is they literally cut your Wi-Fi speed in half. And that's because Half the time they're talking back to the main access point, half the time they're talking to your device. That means they can only transmit to your device about half the time, half the speed. That's why we've mostly gone to mesh systems. Mesh systems generally will have a separate back channel for communicating to the main access point. That doesn't impede the speed of the Wi-Fi access. So you get a very much better performance as you're getting farther and farther away from the main unit using those Wi-Fi satellites if you have a mesh system. At home, I have an Eero. I really like Eero. I have Orbi. Orbi's probably the fastest, but not as sophisticated as the Eero. I know mesh systems are more expensive, but using a mesh system will give you a much better result, in my opinion, uh, than using uh, signal extenders. There's the advantage also that you can add uh, satellites to almost all mesh systems at a lower cost. You buy an extra satellite so you can extend it as needed. And generally, uh, as long as you position the satellites within good range of the main unit, you're going to be able to boost your Wi-Fi uh, farther and farther out. So that works pretty well. There are a lot more tips that Jim has about Wi-Fi. I would recommend reading that article in Ars Technica for all of the ins and outs. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. I will give you one more um, a point that might help a lot. Sometimes Wi-Fi just isn't going to make it 
from this end of the house to that end of the house, uh, in which case you might use a wired solution to expand your Wi-Fi. What? Wired to expand my Wi-Fi? Well, you already have wires in the walls of your house. You have your electrical grid. You also have, probably from your cable television system, you have coaxial cable in the walls. Both of those can be used to extend Wi-Fi. I recommend and I've used the TP-Link uh, home line uh, networking or power line networking devices. They're fairly inexpensive. The way it works is you'll have your Wi-Fi access point, your main router here in, uh, let's say, the living room. By the way, that's one other point Jim mentions is put that as central as possible, obviously, to shorten the distances uh, to the radius instead of the full length of the house. But you've got your centralized Wi-Fi access point. You get one of the little power line adapters, plug it in via Ethernet, then plug it into the wall. And as long as you don't have a junction box in between that plug in the wall and another point in the house, you can plug a receiver into the other end. Now these are connected via physical wires, your electrical wires, and it has either a Wi-Fi access point on it, TP-Link makes those, or another Ethernet jack that you could put into one of the satellites. That's one of the nice things about the old Eero system is you could actually put an Ethernet into the satellites to expand your Wi-Fi. It still counts as one system, but uh, it's helped out by the wire in the wall. So that's uh, that's uh, TP-Link. Others make these power line networking. Uh, they're fairly inexpensive, and that's a really good way to expand your network using wiring in the house. I mentioned cable. The coaxial cable can also be used with a system called Mocha, but uh, you'll need to have a little bit more expensive Mocha adapters. Same idea, though, one on each end that's connected via Ethernet to an access point. So before the, all of this, is talks, I'm talking about spending money. Before you spend a lot of money on new gear, it's well worth doing an assay of the house and try moving things around a little bit. A couple of things to keep in mind. 2.4 gigahertz is a more crowded band. That's the original Wi-Fi band, but it's the one that goes the farthest. If you're trying to get something outdoors like a doorbell, 2.4 gigahertz is almost always the best choice. 5 gigahertz may work better. It doesn't go through walls as well, but for that reason, there's less interference from neighbors and other Wi-Fi going on in the house. So Generally, if you're nearby five giga, uh, an access point or a satellite, five gigahertz is preferable. It's when you're far away that you want to go to 2.4 gigahertz. New gear will always improve uh, your connectivity. There is now a new standard Wi-Fi uh, 6, that's 802.11ax, that has some other features to help solve this problem. Uh, eventually, you're going to get more and more Wi-Fi 6 devices that will be able to take advantage of a Wi-Fi 6 router. So maybe the next time you buy a router, you might want to look at Wi-Fi 6. There's a lot there. It's a difficult challenge. And as any radio engineer will tell you, RF is kind of voodoo science. It's very difficult to figure out where things should be placed. But it, you can off, often improve your signal just by a slight repositioning of the satellites, the access points, and, uh, and of course, your devices. Mm -hmm. But it is possible to improve your Wi-Fi. And it's well, well worth it. Anyway, I'm glad you were here. And I'm here. And I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. And I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. What was the post-war world of amateur radio like? Let's take a look at our hobby as it existed in the late 1940s. In November 1945, amateurs were allowed back on the air on the 10-meter, 5-meter, and the new 2-meter band. The 5-meter band from 56 to 60 megacycles was temporary. By March 1946, we were moved in the great post-war frequency shuffle to our new 6-meter home from 50 to 54 megacycles. As for the new 2-meter band, it replaced our old 2.5-meter allocation, which ran from 112 through 116 megacycles. Throughout 1946, the military gradually vacated the 80, 75, 40, and 20-meter bands turning them back over to amateur operations. We lost a few frequencies, 
the 160-meter band was staying in the hands of the military for Loran radio navigation, and we lost the top 300 kilocycles of 10 meters from 29.7 to 30 megacycles. To compensate us for this loss, the FCC in 1946 gave hams an allocation of 27 megacycles to be shared on a secondary basis with industrial, scientific, and medical devices. Dubbed the 11-meter band, it was unique as the only HF allocation were A0 and A2 emissions were allowed. The amateur population was pushing 60,000 and the FCC was running out of W call signs in the nine call areas. So the FCC created the 10th call district in 1946 and redrew the district boundaries. The license structure was the same as before the war. Class A hams had all amateur privileges, including exclusive use of the 75 and 20 meter phone bands. Class B had all CW privileges and phone operation on 10 meters and above. Note, at that time, 40 meters was CW only and 15 meters didn't exist yet. Class C had the same frequencies as Class B, but it was a mail order license for those in remote areas. The only change the FCC made to the license structure in the 1940s was to allow applicants to copy the code either by printing or by longhand. Prior to the war, the code test had to be copied in longhand only. Most hams used CW or AM phone, but there were two new modes on the horizon. Narrowband FM enjoyed a brief surge in popularity. QST had several articles on VHF and even HF FM operation. Phase modulation, a variation on FM, made its first appearance in 1947. But the big news was something called SSSC, or Single Sideband Suppressed Carrier. SSB, as it would eventually be called, appeared on the ham bands late in 1947. Throughout 1948, QST was full of articles on this new mode. And how do you get your FM or sideband signal to the antenna? Try an item developed during the war, coaxial cable. And with coax came a new concern over reflected power. Thus, the first SWR meters were described in QST. So, what rig do you want to use on the air? How about war surplus? Starting in late 1946, the pages of QST and CQ were filled with ads for military surplus equipment. Numerous articles showed how to modify these rigs for amateur use. The most popular war surplus receiver was the BC-342, which was built like a battleship and tuned from 1.5 to 18 megacycles. I operated one in my novice days. Maybe you want a new rig. Try the Halicrafters model S40, the Hammerlin HQ-129X, which was another receiver I owned, the National NC-46, or the Collins 75A. But the Packard of the post-war radios had to be the Halicrafters SX-42 receiver. This Radio Man's radio had every possible feature, tuned from 540 kilocycles to 110 megacycles, and cost $250 in 1946. That's about $1,700 today. Perhaps you would like to build your own rig. GE, Sylvania, and RCA had pages of ads showing off the new miniature and sub-miniature tubes. The sub-minis were only one and a half inches tall and three-eighths of an inch wide. For those who think the two-meter HT was an invention of the 1970s, it may surprise you to learn that they existed in 1947 using those tiny tubes. But be careful when you get on the air. A new term is finding its way into the amateur world. TVI. In 1947, the FCC eliminated TV Channel 1 to reduce 6-meter interference, but amateurs had to learn to shield their equipment. With the help of good engineering practices, the TVI monster was kept at bay. Sort of. The Atlantic City Conference was held in 1947. Hams gained a 15-meter band, which was eventually allocated to us in 1952. 
amateurs proved their worth as two disasters, one natural and one man-made, struck Texas in April 1947. Tornadoes sliced through the state, killing 150. And in Texas City, an explosion on board a freighter set off a chain reaction that killed 600, wounded 2,000, and destroyed two square miles of the city. Dozens of portable and mobile stations rushed to the scene and provided necessary communications on 75 and 10 meters. Also, on a somber note, Kenneth B. Warner, W1EH, the secretary and general manager of the ARRL since 1919, died in 1948. By the way, do you need a job? Are you bored with your life? Do you crave adventure? Then Helicrafters has a job for you. In the fall of 1947, they are sponsoring a six-month expedition to the Dark Continent, Africa, the Belgian Congo to be exact. They need an experienced Class A amateur to operate the radio equipment. If you feel you are qualified, send them your application by July 1st, 1947. Void were prohibited. Finally, what's an amplifying crystal? You don't know? Well, maybe you know it better by its other name, the transistor. This new device was first described in the October 1948 issue of QST. No one at that time realized the full potential of this little component or knew how it would revolutionize the world of communications. In our next installment, we will take a look at the 1950s, 1958 to be exact. In 2021, Japan's Minister of Digital Agency, Dr. Karen Makishima, established an advisory board that aims to encourage youth in amateur radio. Historically, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications considered that amateur radio should be treated in the same way as professional radio services, whose purpose is to ensure reliable communication. But, since the essence of amateur radio is experimental and educational, they now believe it should be treated differently to professional and commercial radio users. In November of 2021, the Ministry of Communications produced a report titled Radio Policy Council in the Age of Digital Transformation, which noted that the amateur radio population in Japan is declining and that new amateurs must be encouraged through various efforts. The report also said that young people will lead the future and that the Ministry should consider creating an environment that makes it easier for people to start in amateur radio. The Ministry said that it would proceed with studies towards the realisation of a system and an environment that makes it easier to make use of amateur radio, such as the development of an experimental and research environment. The Ministry also said it would speed up the procedure for acquiring an amateur radio licence to make it easier to establish and operate radio stations. The new advisory board held their first meeting on January the 26th, 2022. Foundations of Amateur Radio During the week I was reading a comment from another amateur about digital modes. Tucked inside that comment was a phrase that could easily have been overlooked, but it reminded me that there is plenty to learn and test in the field of amateur radio. The phrase, requires actual understanding of audio level paths, was uttered by Chris Victor Kilo to Charlie Juliet Bravo, and it prompted a brief conversation at the time but I've been working on it ever since. Where I arrived at is an attempt, incomplete as yet, to design a mechanism to show the impact of various transmitter settings on the received audio in such a way that you can test your own gear and see the result. Before I explain how I'm doing this, let me describe why it's important. Using a radio in concept is pretty simple. If you yell into the microphone, the audio comes out distorted, and if you whisper, it might also be distorted, but in a different way. Neither is conducive to communication. One way to improve this is a tool called the ALC. Using automatic level control as a guide to what level your audio should be is outlined in every amateur radio manual I've seen. But how much it matters and to what extent is left unsaid. If you apply a filter or any number of other fancy options, what happens to your audio? To get some sense of what I'm describing, listening back to your own voice after it comes across HF SSB is surprisingly distorted in comparison to a local recording. You might argue, what's the harm? 
As long as the other station can hear my voice, we're good to go. Sure, if voice is all you're using, but what if it's data? In that case, the audio you're transmitting is actually encoded digital information. To decode it, the software needs to deal with frequencies, distortion, and levels, to name a few. In computer science, garbage in, garbage out is the concept that flawed or nonsense input data produces nonsense output. In our case, if you transmit garbage, the receiver is going to start with garbage, and what gets decoded is likely not what you expect. Without going into error correction, essentially the cleaner the path between the transmitter and the receiver, the higher the chances of success. And to be fair, you already know this when you attempt to work a pileup on a noisy band. Again, again, just a prefix, again. Sound familiar? To achieve this, I started with the idea that you could transmit a tone, and if you knew what it was, you could determine the difference between what was sent and what was received. My first step was to generate a single 1 kHz tone, but then I wondered what would happen if you did multiple tones one after the other. My current version is an audio frequency sweep, running from 0 to 5 kHz in 5 seconds. It's essentially a computer-generated sequence of tones with known characteristics. You transmit this audio file using your radio, and then record it off-air, either from a local receiver, WebSDR, or the radio belonging to a friend. Using the recording, you can create a spectrogram, a picture, showing the frequencies over time present in the audio. Compare the two, and you just learned what each setting on your radio does precisely to the audio. Of course, it's simple for me to say this, but I'm working on using a tool I've spoken about before, CSDR, to do the heavy lifting so you can actually do a meaningful comparison between the various audio files. In the meantime, I've managed to use SOX, the so-called Swiss Army knife of sound processing programs, to both generate the audio sweep and draw a preliminary spectrogram. Next up is showing some side-by-side -side images of various radio settings and their effect on the spectrogram. I'll publish this on my website when I have something to show and tell. I also don't yet know if my source audio file is going to be sufficient, but I'll subject that to some testing as well. For example, I'm investigating multiple simultaneous audio sweeps with different frequency ranges. The more complex the spectrogram, the more we might be able to learn from the distortion on receive. But time will tell. If you have some ideas on how to improve this, let me know. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. And now, Parks on the Air News. Parks on the Air recently launched a new park management platform giving park managers a quick and easy way to manage their parks. As a result, we have recently brought 10 new programs into the Parks on the Air family. Keep your radios ready and listening for activations from Jamaica, Finland, Azores, Estonia, Guatemala, Bulgaria, St. Kitts and Nevis, South Africa, Ecuador, and the Russian Federation. With the growth of Poda DX, we are always looking for DX volunteers to help bring new entities online. If your country, or one you'd like to represent, is not yet part of POTA, please reach out via the Contact Us link from ParksOnTheAir.com and we'll help you get started as a volunteer country administrator. January also marked the completion of the Winter Support Your Parks event. In spite of the cold, 582 activators put 747 parks on the air from 23 different DX entities. With WA7PBE making the most activator QSOs, KE0MME activating the most parks. On the hunting side, N3XLS made the most hunter QSOs and also hunted the most parks. In DX during the event, VE3XNS made the most DX QSOs as an activator and JF7RJM activated the most parks. In the club category, K4YTZ took home the prize as the club that made the most QSOs during the two-day weekend. And now for the monthly stats update. Beginning in 2022, we'll be shifting our focus during the monthly updates to spend more time talking about the number of activations. After all, that's what POTA is all about. Winter is certainly not slowing down the amount of activity in POTA. During the month of January, there were 7,702 activations out of 8,016 attempts, made by 1,472 activators from 3,105 different parks located in 32 different DX entities. The top activator for the month was K4NYM, who did 142 activations from 62 different parks. The top hunters for the month were CU3HY, who hunted 909 parks, 
and N3XLS, who made 1,662 CUSOs as a hunter. We'd like to call special attention to the fact that this was the first time a DX station topped the overall charts during our monthly updates. Congratulations, Mike. In our POTA DX corner, just like last month, England was our Region 1 leader with 42 activations, Canada was our Region 2 leader with approximately 315 activations, and Japan was our Region 3 leader with 299 activations. The top DX activator for the month was JF7RJM with 59 activations from 45 different parks. Congratulations to JF7RJM and Japan for the first month where the DX category charts were topped by a station outside of Region 2. And last but not least, let's check in on the progress of the Bailey Sprott Challenge. In 2021, N5HA and W9AV each managed to hunt a park every single day. So in 2022, we're following along to see if anyone else can match their feet. At 30 days into the month, we have five activators who have activated every day of the year. WC1N, KE8, PZN, N2, NWK, KB3, WAV, and KD4, MZN. We also have had 91 hunters who have contacted an activator every single day. To all of the Bailey Sprott chasers, congrats on your success so far, and we look forward to seeing how you do throughout the year. For January's bonus feature, we're going to touch on one aspect of logging that sometimes causes confusion. What is the difference between station and operator in the ADIF files, and how does POTA actually use them? At its most basic level, we only need to look as far as the ADIF standard. The station call sign is the logging station's call sign, or the call sign used over the air, and the operator is the logging operator's call sign. One of the most common mistakes we see is activators putting things in the operator field that aren't call signs, things like names and initials. In most situations, when an activator is out by themselves, they are both the station and the operator and should have their call sign in both fields. The only scenario in POTA where you would normally have a different station and operator is when you are doing a club activation. The call sign being given over the air is something different from your own. Refer back to the ADIF definition of the logging station's call sign, i.e. the call sign used over the air. The way this is used in POTA is so that the club, i.e. the station, can do the activation, but members of the club who aren't actually giving their own call signs over the air can still get activator credit for the QSOS where they are the operator. Because this is a single contact, it is stored once and the hunter gets credit for one QSO. The station and operator fields are not intended to be a way to shortcut logging if two people are activating together and giving both call signs over the air. If this is done, the system would behave as though one of the activators was a club the other was an individual. This would only store one QSO and the hunter would only get one credit. Furthermore, some of our monthly reporting and SYP event data would exclude the call sign in the station field when we are evaluating totals for individual prizes because it looks like a club log. If you are passing the bike and both making contacts, you both need to submit your own log so that you don't shortchange your hunters or yourselves. This concludes our January 2022 Parks on the Air update. Thank you to everyone who provided pictures for us to share during the video updates. We'll be cycling through them over the next several months. If you have pictures you'd like to see during the video version of these updates, send them to November 3, Victor Echo Mike at parksontheair.com. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. Time now for the AMSAT report. Last week, we noted that the crossband repeater on the ISS had been turned on. It sure is a lot of fun with the orbit differing from those of other satellites. Those in the U.S. Southeast will be able to work Mexico, Central America, and the northern parts of South America. Of course, the Caribbean is well within that window. Another old-time satellite that's back in sunlight is FO-29. It is a sideband satellite and works good for its age. With as many satellites as we have in orbit, there are some that are rarely used, and you may find yourself the only one on that satellite. Thus, the moral of the story is give as many satellites a try as you're capable of working. If you and someone else are the only ones on, you'll have a great pass for a long QSO. The AMSAT report comes to us each week, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO.
BBC News reports a rocket launched by Elon Musk's space exploration company is on course to crash into the moon and explode. The Falcon 9 booster was launched in 2015, but after completing its mission, it did not have enough fuel to return towards Earth and instead remained in space. Astronomer Jonathan McDowell told BBC News it will be the first known uncontrolled rocket collision with the moon. The rocket was abandoned in high orbit seven years ago after it completed a mission to send a space weather satellite on a million-mile journey. It was part of Mr. Musk's space exploration program, SpaceX, a commercial company that ultimately aims to get humans living on other planets. Since 2015, the rocket has been pulled by different gravitational forces of the Earth, Moon, and Sun, making its orbit somewhat chaotic, explains Professor McDowell from the U.S.-based Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. It's been dead just following the laws of gravity. It's joined millions of other pieces of space junk, machinery discarded in space after completing missions without enough energy to return to Earth. The collision is due to happen on March 4th, where the rocket will explode as it makes contact. It's basically a four-ton empty metal tank with a rocket engine on the back. And so, if you imagine throwing that at a rock at 5,000 miles an hour, it's not going to be happy, Professor McDowell says. It will leave a small artificial crater on the moon's surface. Bill Gray, who uses software to track near-Earth space objects, projects that it made a close flyby on January 5th. On March 4th, it's likely to hit the moon far side, he says. In 2009, Professor McDowell and other astronomers performed an experiment in which a similar-sized rocket was crashed into the moon. Sensors gathered evidence of the collision so they could study the crater. This means scientists are unlikely to learn anything new from this crash, Professor McDowell explains. He adds that while there are no consequences now to space debris left to drift and occasionally crash, there could be in the future. If we get into the future where there are cities and bases on the moon, we want to know what's out there. It's much easier to get that organized when there is slow traffic in space, rather than waiting until it's a problem. And what happens between now and March 4th? Well, the rocket will continue to follow the laws of gravity, careening through space before it ends its days smashing into the moon. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports three new sunspot groups appeared on February 3rd, 6th, and 8th. Average daily sunspot number rose slightly during the February 3 through 9 reporting week from 81.3 last week to 83.9. Average daily solar flux also increased modestly from 123.1 to 126. Space weather woman Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW, has posted a new update. This thing we're watching, we've got about a 5% chance of X-class flares over the next couple days. It is giving us about a 15% chance of M-class flares. So if you're an amateur radio operator and you're having noise on the bands, this is, this is the culprit right here. Believe it or not, region 2939, which is this one here, is actually rotating now to the west limb and we're not getting all that much from it anymore. Um, but luckily, solar flux is still staying within, uh, you know, in, in the triple digits and it's going to continue to be that way because we have even more regions on the sun's far side. Space weather woman Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. According to the YL Beam newsletter, an Argentine amateur radio operator has accomplished the first HF activation of the highest peak in the Summits on Air program, fulfilling a long-standing goal. On January 10th, Diego Lizarraga, LU9MZO, operated from the Aconagua peak, which is at least 7,000 meters high. It's also the highest peak in the Americas. This is the first time any amateur radio has made contacts from the Aconagua using one of the HF bands. The previous and first activation in 2019 was executed using 2 meter FM. According to the reports, he spent an hour and a half on the air using 40 meters and found time as well to work some stations on VHF and UHF. His total for the day was 64 contacts, 15 of them on HF. He was heard as far away as Buenos Aires, San Luis, the Mendoza provinces in Argentina, as well as into Chile. His dream of operating from there on HF has been a few years in the planning, and the timing worked out well for him. As he descended from the peak to the base camp some 4,300 meters below, the snow had already begun to fall, and on January 12th he returned to the entry of Aconagua Park, where he was cheered on by friends and relatives.
The BBC show Crowd Science recently explained how radios work, and BBC World Service presenter Gareth Mitchell, Mike Seven Golf Juliet Mike, took his colleague Jeff Marsh to a little known room in the BBC called the Radio Shack. So, how is a small budget pocket radio able to recreate all the atmosphere and sounds of a football match? One of Crowd Science's listeners, Andy, wanted to know about the science enabling his radio listening. So the crowd science presenter, Jeff Marsh, set off, microphone in hand of course, to follow the journey of sound on the radio. Starting with the microphone itself, Jeff learned how acoustic energy is converted into electrical signals. Then BBC World Service presenter Gareth, who is a member of the BBC Amateur Radio Club, took Jeff to a little known room in the BBC called the Radio Shack. We, of course, know it better as the home of the BBC Radio Group, call sign Golf 8 Bravo Bravo Charlie. Gareth demonstrated how microphone signals are attached to radio waves before being sent over the airwaves. They took a radio kit apart to understand how these waves are received and converted back into sound waves to be heard in a loudspeaker. Jeff Marsh also talked to a speech and hearing specialist who, through the use of auditory illusions, showed that our brains are often filling in the missing bits of lower quality audio. Jeff also visited an acoustic lab at Salford University, where he heard a demonstration of object-based audio. This technology could enable us to create our own personal mix of dramas and sports, such as heightening the commentary sound or choosing to hear just the crowd, just by using the everyday speakers we have lying around, including mobile phones. You can tune in and join the Crowd Science programme at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash programmes. A special honor is awaiting a young amateur who has shown extraordinary care and initiative in helping the community on and off the air. The Young Ham Lends a Hand contest is being held by Carol Perry, WB2MGP, Director of Youth Activities for the Radio Club of America. It is sponsored by the RCA and the Quarter Century Wireless Association. Any young amateur can be nominated for their volunteer efforts, whether the youngster has aided someone in the military, the community, a senior, or has even acted as a mentor to other amateurs. The application forms are due in by the 1st of April, and the winner receives a $100 stipend. The winner will be announced at the youth forum held at Hamvention in Xenia, Ohio. For details, contact Carol Perry at wb2mgp at gmail.com. The creator of the Automatic Packet Reporting System, or APRS, Bob Bruninga, WB4APR of Glen Burnie, Maryland, died on February 7th. With a look back at the life of WB4APR, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this special report. An ARRL life member, Bruninga was 73. He succumbed to cancer and the effects of COVID-19. While best known for APRS, Berninga, a retired U.S. Naval Academy senior research engineer, had an abiding interest in alternative power sources such as solar power. In 2018, he authored Energy Choices for the Radio Amateur, published by ARRL. Berninga drove an all-electric car and had experimented with a variety of electric-powered vehicles since the 1980s. What became APRS had its origins in 1982. That Apple II program was ported to the IBM PC platform in 1988 and renamed APRS in 1992. The recognized North American APRS frequency is 144.39 MHz. ARRL contributing editor Ward Silver, N0AX, said Bruninga kept pushing APRS beyond its origins as a position reporting system. Bob's far-reaching vision and imagination were as good as it gets, Silver said. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. APRS originated when Bruninga wrote his first data map program that plotted the positions of U.S. Navy ships for the Apple II platform. A couple of years later, he developed what he called the Connectionless Emergency Traffic System on the VIC-20 and Commodore 64 platforms for digital packet communications to support an endurance race. 
The program was ported to the IBM PC platform in 1988 and was later renamed APRS. APRS is now globally linked via the internet. Bruninga founded the Appalachian Trail Golden Packet event, which fields APRS nodes from Stone Mountain in Georgia to Mount Kadatin in Maine each July. He developed and helped implement numerous other uses of APRS in support of what's become the ham radio of things, with great potential for future amateur radio applications. Bob's far-reaching vision and imagination were as good as it gets. Berninga mentored USNA midshipmen in building and launching amateur radio satellites and CubeSats, beginning with PCSat in 2001. PCSat was the first satellite to directly report its precise position to users via its onboard GPS module. Subsequent USNA spacecraft included PSK-31 capability, HF to UHF, and other innovations. Amateur radio on the International Space Station ARRL liaison Rosalie White, K1STO, recalled that Bruninga attended many ARIS international meetings and contributed enormously to ARIS, APRS, activities, leading a team in developing protocols and software for rapid message exchange via a packet robot. White said APRS remains a key staple in the new ARIS interoperable radio system that's now on board the ISS. She added that Bruninga offered input for future NASA lunar and gateway opportunities in which ARIS hopes to take part. Last year, ARRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA, on behalf of the ARRL, honored Bruninga with a brick in the ARRL Diamond Club Terrace at ARRL headquarters. ARRL sent him a letter of appreciation along with a replica of the brick. Bruninga held a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology and a master's degree in electrical engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School. Bruninga was a 20-year U.S. Navy veteran. Dayton Hamvention honored him in 1988 with its Technical Excellence Award. Bruninga authored and co-authored numerous academic papers over the years and was frequently in demand as a speaker and presenter at amateur radio gatherings. Survivors include his wife, Elise Albert, daughter, Bethan Bruninga Sokolar, WE4APR, and son, AJ Bruninga, WA4APR. Arrangements are pending, although his daughter said that a celebratory memorial service will be held this summer in Annapolis, Maryland. The International Amateur Radio Union reports that the National Amateur Radio Society in Venezuela is celebrating its 88th anniversary. The Society's national president, Alfredo Medina, Yankee Victor 5 Sierra Foxtrot, said that way back in 1934, a group of experimenters, most of them with important positions in the broadcast industry, met and decided to create an organization to represent radio amateurs in Venezuela. And that's how the radio club Venezolano was born. Since its creation, the mission of the society was to bring together communications enthusiasts without distinctions of any kind, in order to experiment for the advancement of technology and to help others and the nation in times of need. In addition, they worked for the strengthening of amateur radio, transmitting the value that radio amateurs are public servants of a universal nature. In February 1936, the Venezuelan government first formed the Ministry of Communications and thus the first permits for the operation of amateur stations were issued, including the call sign Yankee Victor 5 Alpha Juliet, the official station of the society and representative of the voice of Venezuela to the world. That same year, the radio club was admitted as Venezuela's representative to the IARU, the highest body in world amateur radio. Thanks to the efforts of radio amateurs, the Society is the representative institution of Venezuelan radio amateurs, managing to create the platforms and protect the interest of hams for the work of the generations to come. Venezuelan amateurs should be proud of the achievements of so many years, which have been consolidated with the joint effort of old and new generations. The Society has been training new amateurs since 1936, managing the QSL Bureau since 1937, establishing regional representation since 1953, and coordinating the National Emergency Network, which was first formed in 1958. 
Alfredo said that future leaders and partners of the Radio Club Venezolano have the responsibility in their hobby to strengthen and project goodwill, respect and admiration to the Venezuelan people and government, thus continuing to represent the voice of their country on the world stage. On Thursday, February 3rd at 1.13 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Falcon 9 launched 49 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Falcon 9's second stage deployed the satellites into their intended orbit with a perigee of approximately 210 kilometers above Earth and each satellite achieved controlled flight. SpaceX deploys its satellites into these lower orbits so that in the very rare case any satellite does not pass initial system checkouts, it will quickly be deorbited by atmospheric drag. While the low deployment altitude requires more capable satellites at a considerable cost to us, it's the right thing to do to maintain a sustainable space environment. Unfortunately, the satellites deployed on Thursday were significantly impacted by a geomagnetic storm on Friday. These storms caused the atmosphere to warm and atmospheric density at our low deployment altitudes to increase. In fact, onboard GPS suggests the escalation speed and severity of the storm caused atmospheric drag to increase up to 50% higher than during previous launches. The Starlink team commanded the satellites into a safe mode where they would fly edge on like a sheet of paper to minimize drag to effectively take cover from the storm and continued to work closely with the Space Force's 18th Space Control Squadron and LEO Labs to provide updates on the satellites based on ground radars. Preliminary analysis shows the increased drag at the low altitudes prevented the satellites from leaving safe mode to begin orbit raising maneuvers and up to 40 of the satellites will re-enter or already have re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. The deorbiting satellites pose zero collision risk with other satellites and by design demise upon atmospheric re-entry, meaning no orbital debris is created and no satellite parts hit the ground. This unique situation demonstrates the great lengths the Starlink team has gone to ensure the system is on the leading edge of on-orbit debris mitigation. Meanwhile, SpaceX was successful in launching a Falcon 9 carrying NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, mission to an interplanetary transfer orbit from Space Launch Complex 4 East at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. DART is humanity's first planetary defense test mission to see if intentionally crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid is an effective way to change its course should an Earth-threatening asteroid be discovered in the future. This was the third flight for this Falcon 9's first stage booster, which previously supported launch of Sentinel-6, Michael Freelich, and a Starlink mission. Three of the four crew members in the SpaceX Crew-4 launch to the International Space Station are amateur radio licensees. They are Robert Hines, KI-5RQT, Kajel Lindgren, KO-5MOS, and Samantha Cristoforetti, IZ-0UDF. Lindgren and Cristoforetti have served previously on the ISS. Crew-4 is set to launch on April 15th for a six-month stay. Crew-4 will be the fourth crew rotation mission of SpaceX's Human Space Transportation System and its fifth flight with astronauts, including the Demo-2 test flight to the space station through NASA's Commercial Crew Program. The mission will launch on a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft and Falcon 9 rocket from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Last week, NASA and its international partners approved crew members for Axiom Space's first private astronaut mission to the space station. Called Axiom Mission 1, or AX-1, the flight is targeted to launch on March 30th from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The AX-1 crew will fly on Crew Dragon Endeavor to and from the space station. After 10 days in orbit, the AX-1 crew will splash down off the coast of Florida. Axiom Space astronauts Michael Lopez Alegria, Larry Connor, Mark Pathy, and Etienne Stibb 
are prime crew members of the AX-1 mission. The quartet is scheduled to spend eight days aboard the ISS, conducting science, education, and commercial activities before returning to Earth. This represents another significant milestone in our efforts to create a low-Earth orbit economy, said Phil McAllister, Director of Commercial Space Flight at NASA. According to NBC News, the panel of investigators working for the United States intelligence agencies has concluded that highly directional electromagnetic pulses are partly to blame for a baffling set of brain injuries reported by American spies and diplomats working abroad as far back as 2016. The scientists' conclusions affirm one previous theory for what has come to be called Havana Syndrome, the findings indicate the radio signals were transmitted by an external device afflicting some Central Intelligence Agency officers and diplomats. The panel's probe did not include attempts to determine who was behind the transmissions of the pulsed electromagnetic energy. The syndrome takes its name from the first group of people who exhibited such symptoms while assigned to the United States Embassy in Havana, Cuba. Officials have said that similar symptoms have since been reported by Americans working for the U.S. government in 70 different countries. The application period has opened for the Youth on the Air Camp being held June 12th through June 17th. Young amateurs in International Amateur Radio Union Region 2, the Americas, who are ages 15 through 25, are welcome to attend this year's camp, which will take place again at the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting in Westchester Township, Ohio. The application deadline is March 1st, and the application process is free. Campers will be notified by March 15th if they are accepted, and those accepted will need to send a $100 deposit. The camp is encouraging young amateurs to attend from different areas of North, Central, and South America. For information about scholarships, waivers, and travel assistance, visit the website youthontheair.org. If there are changes in the COVID-19 pandemic status or CDC guidelines, organizers are committed to notifying everyone as much in advance as possible if that has an impact on the camp. Recently, the first ever episode of Ask the Monday Night Net by Essex Ham covered how to pluck up the courage, overcome the fear of the microphone and get on air. Ask the Monday Night Net is where a question can be put to the attendees of the weekly on-air meetup to get some opinions on an aspect of ham radio. If you have a question for Ask the Monday Night Net, drop them an email to askmonday at essexham.co.uk. You can watch the recent Mike Shy conversation on the Essex Ham Radio YouTube channel. The Essex Ham Monday Night Net takes place every Monday at 8pm on the GB3 Delta Alpha repeater located in Danbury. It's also streamed on the web and there's a chat room. Further information can be found at www.essexham.co.uk forward slash essexham hyphen net. The Monday Night Net was launched in October 2011 by Pete, Mike Zero, Papa, Sierra X-Ray and Jim, Two Echo Zero, Romeo, Mike, India, with the aim of creating a meeting place for new M6 Foundation license holders to talk, ask questions and gain confidence. Essex Hams Net has now become a regular on-air meeting place for both newly licensed hams as well as experienced amateur radio operators and enables local hams to share information, ask for advice and get to meet new voices. The net is moderated by a controller. Normally, the Monday Night Net is chaired by either Pete, Mike Zero, Papa, Sierra, X-Ray or Rachel, Golf 6 Alpha, Mike, Yankee. The net operates in a round table style. The chair keeps a list of who's on frequency and tries to give everyone a turn in rotation. If you want to join, please wait for the net controller to ask for new members to join in. Normally, a call goes out for new participants when the bottom of the list is reached. If you want to be added to the list and don't want to wait until the call for new people goes out, then get the controller's attention by breaking in with your call sign. When there's a pause in the conversation, you'll be acknowledged and invited in by the controller. Remember that the GB3DA Danbury repeater has a timeout of two minutes. Please try to keep your turn within the timeout and to be fair to others on the net by not going over the two minute limit per over. When the net is live, an internet live stream is often set up and a chat room is also available, handy for those who can't join in or want to chat whilst waiting for their turn. Just go to www.essexham.co.uk forward slash chat. When possible, the net controller publishes a summary of the night's activities. 
All the links are on the website. For insights into the planning of the Bouvet Island 3Y OJ de-expedition in November this year, or to hear how amateur radio and other technical pursuits can advance global technology, there are just two of many presentations being offered at the next QSO Today virtual ham expo. It's taking place on March 12th and 13th. Presentations will also include some hands-on guidance on operating and building techniques. In all, there will be more than 60 notable amateurs offering perspectives on at least 20 different topics. The keynote speaker is Courtney Duncan, N5BF, who recently retired from NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, where he worked on digital and radio frequency hardware and software for various space missions. His most recent project was the Ingenuity Mars helicopter, for which he was telecommunications lead. Tickets and additional details are available at QSO Today Ham Expo. That's all one word, dot com. If you drive past John Berry's house in West Anchorage, Alaska, you can't help but notice the huge antennas that seem to reach to the sky. The antenna farm, as John calls it, is his link to communicating with people from all over the world. John Berry has been a ham radio operator for 67 of his 80 years. Originally from Wisconsin, John was introduced to ham radio as a young teen by his father. In 1966, John, his wife Susan, and their young daughter headed north to accept a job teaching in rural Alaska. They took their ham radio equipment with them, and over the next ten years in the bush, they were glad they did. John said, back then, we didn't have any other communication. There were no telephones in the village or anything like that. This enterprising radio ham used his equipment to communicate with his own family in other parts of the USA, to order supplies from Seattle, and to help villagers communicate with one another. He explained that amateur radio operators use non-commercial radio frequencies to transmit their signals, which can be a big plus when cell phones or the internet fails. In Alaska, ham radio has often been a lifeline, particularly in disasters like the 1964 earthquake. John Berry said that that was when ham radio really shined, because again, there were no official communications working, and it was ham radio that got the first messages out. You can read more about John in Alaska at www.alaskanewssource.com. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Replacing rotors on towers is not a fun job. They usually sat for a long time before we decided to replace them, so the bolts and screws will surely be nicely rusted. I know, I have one on my tower right now too. I've done this job a few times in the past, so let's look at the three primary types of installations. From my experience, rotors are mostly installed inside the tower near the bottom or inside the tower near the top. They can also be on the top of the tower outside of the tower frame. By far the worst one to work with is the last, the rotor on the very top and outside of the tower. If you do not have the proper gear, tools, strength and experience, I recommend you hire someone with a cherry picker to do this job for you. If you have the expertise to safely perform this task the way I do them, after deciding the tower is strong enough to survive the job, I mount clamps to the side of the tower remove the mast from the rotor and slide it into my temporary clamps. Swap out the rotor and reinstall the antenna mast into the new rotor. This has to be done on a windless day. As an added precaution on smaller TV antenna grade towers, I always add temporary guy ropes to secure the tower from the tremendous shaking and stresses one of these rotor swap out jobs can put on any tower. If the tower is a fold over type or a roof mount type, I usually refuse to do the job unless the tower is guyed at every 10 to 15 feet with steel cable. I have never done work on a fold over tower above the hinge and neither should you. On towers where the rotor is inside the tower, there is usually some plate or place to install a U-bolt clamp above the rotor. Then I loosen the clamps that hold the mast inside the top of the rotor, slide up the mast, and now tighten the bolts on the U-bolt above the rotor to keep the mast from sliding back down into the rotor. A suitable temporary clamp, which can hold some weight, is a hefty vice grip pliers. On towers without a clamping plate of some type above the rotor, I have used the 2x4 stuffed into the tower in its place. 
Essentially, the rotor removal job is the same process regardless of the location of the rotor inside the tower, either at the bottom or at the top. If the rotor is inside the tower near the top, bending the mast pipe is the big risk. So always insert a wooden dowel rod inside the mast pipe to prevent bending. The dowel rod should be close to the same size as the inside of the mast pipe or it won't prevent bending. These are generally available at your local hardware store. Otherwise, a fat broom handle may fit inside the mast pipe just fine too. Some people insert a second steel pipe that is a tight fit inside the section of mast pipe that passes through the top of the tower and pin it to keep it in place. When replacing the rotor, another trip to the hardware store should be done first to replace all those cheaply plated screws, nuts, and bolts with stainless steel parts. This may be time consuming, but you'll be thankful you took the time years down the road when the new rotor is ready to retire. Otherwise, you'll become an expert with a hacksaw on the tower, which ain't fun. If you decide to hire this job out, be sure to check the yellow pages for companies that trim trees. Their work is largely seasonal, so you may be able to negotiate a lower price for the work if you are willing to wait maybe even months for the truck and be ready to go when they call you and tell you that today is your lucky day. From my experience, tree service people are generally cheaper than TV and tennis service places too. One topic I already mentioned, which is worth repeating, never work on a standing fold-over tower above the hinge. Never climb a base fold-over or roof-mounted tower that is not guide every 10 to 15 feet. Best bet is to never climb any fold-over tower. You should add temporary guides to any light-duty TV antenna tower. And lastly, do what I do. When someone asks you to climb their tower for them, always tell them you reserve the right to stop the job at any time for any reason if you feel your safety is in question and you will not argue or debate about restarting a job which was stopped for safety concerns. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week, a pair of student broadcasters at John Carroll University Adult Alternative WJCU 88.7 in Cleveland were successful in setting a Guinness World Record for the longest consecutive radio interview. From February 5th at 7 a.m. until February 6th at 8.35 a.m., sophomores Zachary Sanutko and Colin Kennedy, the hosts of hip-hop show 808s and Mixtapes, conducted a 25-hour and 35-minute radio interview live on WJCU and Twitch. University Heights Mayor Michael Dillon Brennan, representatives of John Carroll University's Office of the President, as well as members of the local and regional media, were in attendance of the record-breaking moments. The Guinness World Records website has not reflected Sanutko and Kennedy's effort yet, and should update in two or three months, Sanutko said. I can't believe we lasted 25 and a half hours. It got hard in the middle of the night, but with the help of the community and the rest of the university, we did it, Kennedy said in a press release. Thank you to the school and to everyone who passed by the WJCU studio to help encourage us to do the unachievable. The current longest radio interview is listed as 25 hours, 26 minutes long, and it was achieved by Banu Bhakta Nurala, the managing director of Himal FM 90.2, and Ang Finjo Sherpa, a tourism expert and activist in Nepal. The two broke the world record from November 8th to November 9th, 2021, according to the Guinness World Records website. Soon, the world record should shift over to Zachary Sinutko and Colin Kennedy. Attendees for the weekend interview included University Heights Mayor Michael Dillon Brennan, JCU administrators, and local media, according to a press release. 808s and Mixtapes social media manager Emily Davala assisted Sinutko and Kennedy during the long interview, bringing food and facilitating guests during the show. I couldn't be more proud of the members of 808s and Mixtapes. Zachary, Colin, and I put so much hard work into breaking this record. It was extremely exhausting, and I also had to stay up for the full 25.5 hours, Davala said in a press release. It was a fun experience that we will never forget, but I will never do it again. We did it. We really did it. I had my doubts in my mind, but with the help of 808s and Mixtapes social media manager Emily Davala and the rest of the team at WJCU, we did it, Sinutko said in a press release. The best moment of the whole day was when Dr. Masterson from John Carroll University's Children brought a homemade sign to the WJCU studio to encourage us to keep going. Electron Binders Amateur Radio Club in Tulsa, Oklahoma, airs this week in amateur radio.
every week on Club Own KOKTLP 90.9. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5W.